Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shannon Lafren, and I'm the assistant city manager for the city of Greenville. Welcome to our fifth code connection session. And we are so excited to see you all joining us this afternoon. Um, we really enjoy these sessions and these sessions are intended to focus on specific topics and um, subject areas within our development code. Um, it's meant to be an educational session for those of you who may have a lot of experience with zoning codes or may not have any experience with zoning codes. Um, this is an opportunity for us to have a, an opportunity to connect with the community in a different sort of way as we work through our code connection sessions. And so, once again, we're really excited that each of you have joined us here this afternoon. Um, we think that this is an informative way and a fun way to talk about zoning. Um, I think that zoning and planning is fun. Um, I, I even city council the other night even asked me, did you say fun? Yes, I did say fun. This is a fun topic and we want everyone to um, learn from it, but also enjoy, enjoy the zoning code in action, or as we say, Greenville development code in action. So with that, I will quickly introduce our planning team that's here this afternoon and then turn it over to our code consultant team to introduce themselves and we'll get started. Um, I do have with me a number of city staff members this afternoon, including Mary Douglas Hirsch, our planning administrator, Michael Frickson, Edward Kenny, and Chris Kerzak, who are our principal planners for the city. Um, also joined by Rebecca Edwards, our community development manager, MJ Simpson, our communications manager, Mike Blizzard, our help desk manager. So thank you all for being here. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our CZB team. Um, Thomas, are you gonna take the lead on that this afternoon? Sure, I'll kick us off and um, introduce our team as well. Thanks, Janet. So, um, and also thanks, Thanks to everybody who continues to join us for these webinars. We really appreciate this opportunity. We think it's a great opportunity for us to kind of convey to you where we are in the code writing process as we move along and also to continue to get your input and uh, uh, confirmation of direction, your questions, et cetera. So that's also a reminder as we go through the webinar tonight, don't hesitate to, uh, if you have questions, type them into Q&A. I think Shannon will end up uh, fielding the questions and, and, and we'll uh, try to answer those to the best of our abilities. But uh, we really appreciate you all being here. Um, maybe just as uh, a bit of uh, housekeeping, just a reminder, the next webinar will be June 8th at 5 p.m. We do these typically the second Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. So just as a reminder, that's when we'll be on again. So. Tonight we're going to discuss how the uh, how the new code. Thomas, if I could interrupt you before you get just sure. to, so everyone knows, just to um, they feel just if you have questions, type them in the Q and A section so that we can facilitate those later. And if you miss any portion of this, we do record the the webinar and we do put it on our Greenville Development Code page of the city website, which is Greenville SC slash Dev Code. Thank you, Thomas. Great, thanks for the uh, reminder, Shannon. Um, so again, tonight is um, uh, uh, a presentation about how the code will inform what should be done to implement Greenville 2040, GBL 2040, which is the city's recently adopted comprehensive plan. If you go to the next slide quickly, I will just introduce a few of you that are here with us tonight from our team. Christy Dodson from Code Studio is on, Larry, Weston from Weston Consulting is on, and I think Charles Buki from CZB is also on. Um, Tim Carpenter, who's an important component of our team from MRB Group. I don't think that he's on, but he has really been working with us closely on a lot of the engineering, stormwater, and EDSM, engineering design specifications manual work. So uh, a quick shout out to him, because I don't think he's on. But that's our team, and so we'll kind of bounce a little bit back and forth uh, amongst the three of us tonight as we go through the presentation. If you go to the next slide. Um, so this is a quick review of our schedule. You'll see this at every webinar. So we're in, uh, you know, early part of May. So uh, framework uh, for the code is complete. We're working through the area development plans. We'll talk a little bit about those tonight. Uh, those will be complete at the end of June, at the end of June, early July. And we're kind of in the districts and uses uh, 
component of the code. So really starting to get down into the technical details of the code. So just by way of reminder, we'll aim to have this project complete and get to public hearing toward the end of the year, December, uh, early 2023, maybe uh, in terms of public hearings, depending what it takes. Next slide. Uh, you'll see this slide on every slideshow we do as well. It is a reminder that the foundational component of the new development code is to implement the goals of GVL 2040. And just again, quick reminder, goal is 35% of the remaining vacant land in the community. We'd love to preserve 35% of that as green, open, recreational, passive space, affordable housing, 10% of all new housing units would be affordable and uh, ensure that new development and uh, new city policies aim to provide uh, alternative transit options and different forms of mobility. So this is kind of the foundation for the new development code and it remains so. Go to the next slide. So it's interesting that um, as we've had the opportunity to uh, hold some open houses, some in person, some virtually meet with some uh, advisory groups and folks throughout the community. Everybody has been very committed to the three goals to uh, implementing the three goals within the comprehensive plan that I just outlined. But it's also been uh, it's, it's notable that they want that to be done while preserving the integrity of the existing neighborhoods, the character of the existing neighborhoods, and accomplishing or accommodating population growth. Again, there is a recognition that over the course of the next 20 years, uh, Greenville County, Greenville City, the region could add as many as 90,000 households. The goal in, in the comprehensive plan was to accommodate about 20,000 of those 90,000 in the city. And so, the recognition that we would grow and that we will grow and that we should grow was embedded in the comp plan. And so getting those folks into the community uh, in an efficient and orderly manner is a big part of this code, as well as encouraging economic development and growth and supporting economic development and growth within the community. So we want affordable housing, open space and uh, alternative uh, transit options, but we definitely want to hold some things in place, specifically neighborhoods, but accomplish economic growth and population growth. So just keep that in mind. It seems like it may be uh, a somewhat insurmountable task to do this while maintaining that, but we think we have found a way to do that. And again, we'll walk you through the details this evening. You can go to the next slide. Um, so protecting existing neighborhoods, if we just dig down into that a little bit, you can uh, you can see that uh, we've got three uh, three tools that we can essentially utilize to protect these neighborhoods. Right, uh, growth won't be new. Most of the new growth won't be located in these neighborhoods. It will be directed toward the community centers, the nodes, if you will, that were identified in GVL 2040. So what this means is that density has to increase in these nodal areas. So where two or three or four stories of development might be permitted. We may see four, five, six stories, seven stories of development that are allowed in these areas. These specifically identified 10, 11 nodes in the comprehensive plan. So density will increase, heights will increase, and they'll accommodate mixed use development, commercial, residential, institutional, et cetera. Maybe think of these as kind of neighborhood centers or kind of small versions of the downtown, but these would be a place where people come together, but they'll be They'll be different than uh, some of the centers outside of downtown right now, which are more suburban in character. These will be urban in character. Next slide. So, uh, to accomplish population growth, it ties right on to the slide prior. These nodes will not only be mixed use district, but they will also increase density and allow for population. Again, so important to understand that the code that we have right now accommodates suburban growth. What these new centers, these new nodes would do is, accom is accommodate urban growth. So as, the, as we look at potentially 20,000 households moving into the community over the next couple of decades, most of them will land here. There is not easily uh, 
uh, easily annexed land around the community and not a lot of vacant land. And so most of the development would land here. These will look and feel different than many of the community centers in the community now. You can go to the next slide. Um, and so the final component was encourage economic growth and development. So how is that done? I think that there's a couple of ways. The GBL 2040, the comp plan, recommended that 40% of new jobs over the next two decades would be located in Greenville City proper. And so to accommodate that growth, we have to do a couple of things. One is kind of create those innovation districts within these, uh, these nodes, these centers, areas where people would uh, live and work and gather and uh, collaborate on projects, but also with the opportunity for increased density, um, we provide for uh, office space, commercial space uh, that may be desirable to those entities that are moving into the community from other areas. We think that growth from within uh, as an economic engine is, is the most beneficial to the community, that kind of innovative structure, but we also recognize that finding space for companies to land is also important, again, in the nodes, in the centers where we can accommodate that density. You go to the next slide. So as we think about the right zoning standards to and incentives to ensure quality development within the nodes, that's one thing, but kind of an equal, not entirely opposite thing is to address some of the ongoing issues that confront the neighbors and developers today. A few of these are outlined here, but these are some of the pressing issues that we've heard from the community over the course of the past couple of months. These are things such as neighborhood infill and the types of development that is currently being built in some of the existing neighborhoods. Um, how do we address kind of the space between residential and commercial de development, that kind of horizontally mixed use development, but where there is an adjacent property line? How do we buffer that? How do we protect uh, the residential development that may exist from future commercial development? And there's walkability and connectivity what are the minimum standards for sidewalks and trails and how we get around outside of our cars? Um, public realm, um, code language that defines what is expected in our streetscapes, whether that's trees, uh, sidewalks, street furniture, signage, et cetera. And then we wanna get into some of the incentive zoning standards that would further the goals of the Comp plan again, the comprehensive, I'm sorry. Yeah, the comprehensive plan and the zoning code can't resolve all of these issues, but they are a set of tools in the toolbox that can affordable housing, open space and transit. So incentives, maybe density and height. So we'll look at some of those uh, zoning aspects and kind of looming issues that folks have asked us to address in the code. I think as we move into this, I'll turn it over to Christy Dodds and she'll walk through some of these details. Great, thanks Thomas. Um, so as Thomas said, we are gonna do a little bit of a deep dive into some of the zoning tools that can help address some of the um, pressing issues and concerns and, and ideas that are gonna be important for Greenville moving forward. Um, the first one that we're gonna talk about as Thomas laid out is neighborhood infill. So we know that most of the growth is gonna be happening in the nodes and in the corridors, but neighborhoods will evolve some, You know, there are new houses that are gonna be built and as that happens, we want to make sure that the character and the scale of those new homes is in keeping and is appropriate for what, what folks want to see in the neighborhoods themselves, those areas that we're thinking about character, we're thinking about preservation, um, and thinking about that balance of, you know, new development is going to happen and, and wanting to make sure that it happens in an appropriate way. Um, this image um, is one key thing that I want to want you to think about here is um, the difference in um, how the, the houses to the right and the left, you know, they, they also have three stories of living space, um, but they're under roofs that are um, pitched or they, they lean away from either the sidewall or um, the front and back of the building. So think about how that differs a little bit from the, the building in the middle and how we may want to write some districts that um, help resolve some of those, um, those that address the character of that middle building. Should we go to the next slide, please? So how do we do that? Um, this is an example of a district page that we have written for another community. And um, you know, the metrics will be right size for Greenville, um, but some of the tools that 
we're thinking about that have been successful in other areas are things like controlling the area and bulk standards. And what that means is looking at the height in comparison to the lot size and what those setbacks mean. Um, and we always illustrate these in a really graphic way so that it's understandable not only what the requirements are, but where they may apply on the site and what we're talking about, because zoning does just inherently get really technical. And so we find that these graphics really help illustrate the intent of these metrics. So the first thing I want you to look at is in this first set of graphics, and you'll see that the graphics have labels on um, the different metrics that we're trying to control. And some of these things are really inherent to the character of your neighborhood. So stories, the, the first thing that we talk about in stories is we look at it both in number of stories and height in feet. And you'll notice that this says 2.5 stories. And that, um, in addition to the, the next metric down, which is top plate, that's sort of a technical term for measuring um, the top point before your roof actually starts in the building. Um, so those are two key ways that we think about controlling the bulk and mass of a building. So allowing 2.5 stories, it still allows you to have that third story of living space, um, but it requires that third story to be set in a little bit. So it still can be a pretty modern box, right? You don't have to have a, um, an angled roof, but that third story does have to step in a little bit so that it feels more in scale with the, um, the neighboring buildings. Another thing that we like to think about is building width. Um, so along the primary street, which is sort of a, a front, that's a main street, and then on, on corner buildings, so you'll see illustrated in this graphic, also a secondary street, and that's the side of your building. And so we control the width, um, both on that primary front edge, the front of your building, and if you're a corner lot on the side of your building. And by requiring um, widths that are similar in character to the surrounding neighborhood, um, it ensures that the massing and sort of the length of those walls of new development looks similar in scale to the surrounding, care, the surrounding buildings. Um, so those are just a few key ways that we think about bulk and massing. Um, another thing that we will think about, and we'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about walkability, but even in residential neighborhoods, in the second graphic, we um, start to think about things like the amount of windows we want to have on a building, right? It, it brings a friendly face, and we want to make sure that the front of the building is pedestrian oriented, that it, um, that it looks like people's face, right? As opposed to having a garage on the front of your building. Um, so that's another tool that we use to start to reinforce the walkable neighborhoods, the really charming areas that you have in Greenville today, um, making sure that what's on the street are, um, are the faces of the buildings that are friendly, they're pedestrian oriented, and we want to um, actually codify that into the code. Uh, next slide, please. Another issue that we um, are thinking about, particularly as we're discussing the densification of the nodes and corridors, We've had a lot of questions come up about, well, what does that space look like in between um, residential districts and commercial districts? Today, and um, in a lot of places, you'll see things like the image here where you just have a fence. Um, and part of what we want to think about are sets of tools that are, one, context sensitive, so we know that there are different scales of commercial development, right? You have big mixed use that are five, six, seven stories, and that's a different scale than maybe a neighborhood commercial district that may have something like two or three stories. Um, and the, those lot proportions may be different. So we wanna make sure that we have tools that address the, um, the range of those contexts, right? It's not a one size fits all solution. Um, but we also wanna make sure that it, um, it transitions appropriately to that residential neighborhood. So if you'll flip to the next slide. Some of the tools that um, we like to think about are, um, setbacks in height. So you'll see illustrated in the graphic in the sort of top left, um, this idea, this is an illustration for what we call a shallow lot. So that's that's one of those context sensitive ways that um, the transition of the height of that commercial building, um, you can see is being marked in that, um, in, with that label right there. So anything that would get added to that commercial building would need to step back um, so it could get a little bit higher towards the street as you get further away from the residential district, but we want to build that in place. Um, and that's a set of standards for shallow districts. Um, those, those metrics would look different for a, a deep corridor or a deep parcel. So if the mixed use district is on a deeper site, then those transitions are going to be, um, they're going to be bigger. They're going to be deeper because you have more room to make that transition to your protected district in the rear. Um, so there are height transitions and there's also landscaping requirements. So if you'll notice, um, you kind of have to squint at it, 
But if you look at the landscape in um, the top image, you'll see that there is a little tree and there's also a fence. Um, and so the combination of those two really help to make a more shallow transition um, and a more appropriate buffer between that um, shallower site that is the commercial site and the residential to the rear. But the bottom image um, that has just fully landscape. It's a bigger buffer. There are some dense shrubs, some trees. Because there is more space, it's a it's a bigger um, lot that the commercial sits on. Then we have more room to put some landscape transitions in there. So part of this is offering a suite of tools. So you know maybe you can get the really lush landscaping, and we want to make sure that that is an appropriately sized buffer. Um, but in sites that are smaller, maybe you don't have the room to do that. And so there are other options, making sure there's a really good, attractive, aesthetically pleasing fence and the landscaping. So it's coming up with this suite of tools where we can address these transitions in different areas. Next slide, please. Walkability. This is a big issue that we have heard over and over again. We know that walkability is absolutely essential to Greenville. We want it to improve with every project that gets redeveloped. You have amazing infrastructure with things like the Swamp Rabbit Trail. And so we want to make sure that those um, pieces are really highlighted. And as new development comes along, um, some of your corridors and nodes in particular, um, you know, they get better infrastructure than what you're seeing in this picture, right? We want to make sure that there's a really good tree lawn, that we have um, some good street trees, you have protection from some of your faster streets um, that, you know, maybe the city doesn't control, maybe those are state routes. We still want to make sure that we get the components right from the curb to the face of the building that really foster that walkability. Uh, next slide, please. So how are we going to do that? Um, this is an example that we have um, of a transition district that um, was a more suburban context and is becoming more walkable. So you'll notice in this graphic, we have things like a sidewalk standard the minimum width for a tree lawn, um, a minimum spacing of trees. These are things that really add to the walkability of the building um, that make sure that that infrastructure from the back of the curb, you know, even if we can't fix the street, it may be fast, um, we can at least make a better pedestrian environment um, in front of that development. So from the curb to the face of the building. And really another piece of that is making sure that the building itself has some um, good standards for walkability and, and pedestrian, you know, people scale spaces. So when I talked about the windows and the doors on um, residential districts, we are doing the exact same thing here in um, a commercial or mixed use district. So, you know, we say sort of more plenary terms like transparency. And what that means is you're going to have shop fronts. You're going to have windows facing the street. And you'll think about places like downtown that are really walkable. You know, they have a lot of storefronts, a lot of glass in the front of those buildings. And, and so it fosters that people oriented activity. Um, there's also limiting things like the amount of blank walls you can have um, and also requiring certain number of pedestrian access spaces. So we want to make sure that those those connections from the sidewalk to the front door of those buildings, that those are happening at regular intervals so that um, it really makes people feel like that they have that connection into the stores or into whatever use it is that is going into that building. So those are all standards that we are. Um, thinking about and right sizing for Greenville to add to that walkability. Next slide, please. And finally, this is a really big, important piece of achieving a lot of those comprehensive plan goals that Thomas outlined, the open space, the mobility, the affordable housing. We do not have the ability in South Carolina to require things like affordable housing or require, um, you know, if you build a certain amount of space that you have to set aside that for affordable housing. So incentivizing those is going to be our most important tool in achieving these goals. And um, we have talked about this some in the past and I'll just reiterate some of the ways that we're thinking about that is by offering bonuses, like if you provide affordable housing or if you provide really quality pedestrian plazas and open space um, or you know, really good trail connectivity to the Swamp Rabbit Trail that is above and beyond what we're acquiring in the base code if you provide those things, then you would get additional density bonuses. Um, this particularly comes into play with affordable housing. We know that affordable housing is expensive. It's just as expensive as market rate housing to build, right? Um, but you can just collect less rent on it. And so being able to provide that additional density really um, makes it economically feasible for us to, to build affordable housing at a, um, at a rate that 
is needed in a community like Greenville and, and that you've outlined as a goal in your comprehensive plan. Um, and so an important piece of this is that those, those bonuses, um, we're thinking about them actually being codified into the code. So it's not just a vague, yeah, if you provide some, then you'll get a little bit additional. Um, these will be actually codified thresholds to say, um, you must provide a certain percentage and that percentage will be in the code of affordable housing at a certain level. And if you do that, then you are allowed to build this extra density. Um, and so what that does is um, it, it really is a um, issue of fairness, right? You know, everyone understands the rules. It doesn't have to be negotiated on a project by project basis. It's just a, if you do this, then you get that. Um, and it makes it very clear and, and easy for both neighborhoods and developers to understand what's expected of them and what the outcome could be of that development. Next slide, please. Um, and with that, I will hand it back over to Thomas. Thanks, Christy. Um, again, I think I'll just, uh, it, it's worth pointing out what Christy just outlined with regard to incentive zoning. It is, it, it, it is a new concept for the code, but we think that it is an important concept for this code. And again, this would be uh, a code that outlines the, the conditions, the criteria to get, say, additional density on end height. It would be very, very clear. It's not that it has to uh, be a long drawn out planning process or planning commission, et cetera, process. It would be baked into that, into the code um, so that people understood, so that developers, builders understood these are the limits, but these are also the kind of uh, the gets if you give certain percentages at certain percent AMIs, area median incomes for affordable housing. So I think that's important. Larry, you might want to address a little bit here. I know you heard you were at the community meetings, uh, the public outreach with regard to the, the support for these kinds of incentives. I don't know if you want to touch on that or give anything further to say. I would just mention that that in those meetings, it was very clear to it was very clear to us that a range of the participants, whether they were developers or business owners or uh, or neighborhood residents, uh, there was strong support for the objectives that were laid out in in the comp plan and and for the uh, and for the tools that are being are being proposed to address all of those things. It's very hard to have your cake and eat it too, but when it comes to this new code in Greenville, I think we're getting very close to the point where we can have have all of the things that we want and 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 have them at a reasonable cost. Uh, a number of the of the things that um, a number of the things that that Christy mentioned are important to keep in mind. Incentive zoning. Well, well, and Thomas, uh, in, incentive zoning. Uh, very important concept and something that's being introduced uh, here that just was not there before. Uh, the fact that that uh, that a context uh, sensitivity is something that we heard over and over in both our meetings and some of the neighborhood tours we've taken. We've seen examples in which it does make a difference as to what the context is. So there's no one size fits all, but there's a way of addressing it in a way that first takes a a code uh, a code that is 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 clear. There is a there is a, a, a codified threshold that's set, but that instances in which the context is important will be considered. And so, for those of of of, of you who are on the on the webinar, be clear: this is a new code that is looking in some new directions trying some different things and trying them in a way that will help us achieve all of the goals that the uh, citizens of Greenville have set. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Larry. Actually, you kind of uh, uh, tied it to the, the next last slide, I think, if you don't mind, Chris. Um, there are, if you take a look at the map on the right hand side, you know, there are different nodes and within different nodes, uh, different contexts, different uh, recommendations for densities, height, uh, height allowances, et cetera. And so that is something that we're looking at very specifically um, with regard to the, the, the small area uh, plans that we are working on. Uh, there are five of them, again, outlined on that map. We are looking at them each individually. So that is important to keep in mind that it is not a one size fits all. It varies by node to node. Also, I think it's 
worth noting on this particular page, we're starting to uh, get into kind of a, a preview of what the new development code would look like. And it is something that we're trying to make much more graphically uh, rich and uh, ensuring that it's uh, more easily understood by the average reader, whether you're a builder, whether you're a resident, whether you're a, a contractor, architect, et cetera. We want to make sure that it is as easy to read as possible and to, to easily understood. And so this isn't necessarily exactly what the code will look like, but we're, we will try to get a uh, uh, kind of a, a code preview, a, a bit of a stepping stone to what the final code will look like. We'll try to get that out probably June, late June, early July. Um, and so you guys will um, be able to uh, kind of review that and get a more clear, a more detailed uh, understanding of where we're looking to go with the new code. But that's all we have for tonight. I uh, don't know if there are any questions. Shannon, maybe you've received some questions. Uh, if so, we're certainly wide open to uh, certainly open to answer those. Thank you, Thomas and Larry and Christy. We appreciate your information as always. And once again, very informative. And we did have a question, a couple of questions in the chat that, um, that I, I think some of them um, are a little bit different than what we're discussing tonight and trying to keep on target. But the first one is where can I find the definition of walkability? Hmm. Probably a pretty good question. Uh, that is a good question. And uh, I would say that I don't know if there's a specific definition for walkability, but the way we're thinking about walkability uh, based on the meetings that we've had with our uh, small area plan groups is really thinking about accessibility uh, for a resident to access, say, basic commercial opportunities, whether that's a whether that's a dry cleaner, a coffee shop, a restaurant, uh, a, a small grocery store, et cetera, if it is within, say, often we think of about 15, 20 minutes, a mile or so as a very walkable distance. So one of the components of walkability is distance. But the second and probably more important component of walkability is the quality of the experience as you walk along a sidewalk. For example, I think we, we showed a streetscape that had the sidewalk very, very close to the road. One of the things that we would like to codify for is a, uh, a wider green strip to protect folks as they are walking down the road. We heard from many that if they're pushing a carriage or uh, carrying things along uh, a road that's very, a uh, sidewalk that's very close to the curb, it feels unsafe. And so I think walkability is probably looking again at distance, a radius, a mile, give or take, and the quality of that experience, ease of accessibility, curb cuts, can I connect to a trail, can I get, can I can I walk six blocks and maybe get to a trail that connects me to the Swamp Rabbit Trail as kind of the main spine through the community? That's taking it a step further, but I would say distance and quality of experience. And I don't know if Larry or Christy have a different way of explaining it, but um, it, it it probably does have offer uh, or have different definitions depending where you are. Yeah, I think you explained it really well. And you know, there there are a lot of ways to frame walkability, and really. Under the, we're sort of operating in the confines of zoning. You know, it's, it's a different conversation to think about the um, holistic systems of like streets that um, and how those are designed, and and that obviously has an impact of walkability. If you're against a street that is designed for drivers to to go really quickly, then it it, it obviously has a negative impact on walkability, as opposed to a street that's designed for um, bikes, multimodal transit, slower driving. Um, and, and so those are really outside of what we control in zoning. So what we're codifying here is really thinking about, you know, starting at the back of the curb. So the edge of where the street and the, the sort of private realm, the private property starts. Um, so the back of the curb to the face of the building, those are really the areas that we think about controlling as far as putting in good requirements for the streetscapes, putting in good requirements for the sidewalks, making sure the faces of the building are pedestrian oriented. You know, that's that's sort of in the purview of zoning. So that um, those elements are um, what we're really thinking about whenever we're talking about building it into these districts and into the, the standards that development would need to meet as these properties get redeveloped. And I would just, I would just add that the that the that that the good walkability really answers the question. What can I 
am I able to get to things that my household needs, services, other kinds of needs without getting in my car? And am I able to go out and enjoy myself uh, in the neighborhood without getting in a car and going someplace? Am I able to walk to it? And is it convenient? And is it, uh, is it accessible? Is it convenient? And is it, is it comfortable and safe to do it? Thank you all. So our next question um, is, I know y'all are aware and, and some of this um, may not be specific to what y'all are able to answer, but um, I'll, I'll just kind of go through it and we'll, we'll do our best. And, and just for the audience out there tonight, if we can't answer all your questions this night, specifically, if they don't pertain directly to the code or the topic at hand this evening, please feel free to email us at planning at Greenville SC dot gov that's planning at greenville sc dot gov and we'll be glad to get back to you with your answer if we're unable to get to it tonight so the next question concerns the city of greenville and as you all know and i know that y'all are aware that we've been working on developing a sustainability plan um and that 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 plan is being worked on through michael frickson um with the city michael just recently moved from the um city manager's office to the planning department and that, that took place about a month ago. And with that sustainability, um, we'll be also moving to the planning department. Um, and he's, this, this um, question is, how will any of the elements of the new sustainability plan be incorporated into the development code? And how will the development code team ensure that the development code and sustainability plan are integrated and complementary? And if y'all can answer to it, great. If not, I'll, I'll ask Michael to, to chime in. Shannon, I would just say that, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think we looked at, I think there were 19 plans as we started looking at the code, different area plans, neighborhood plans, uh, uh, the sustainability plan. I know it's, 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 in, it's in process, but we really did look at all of that when we started the code. And so the answer to the question is yes, of course, we'll try to incorporate as much sustainability uh, uh, incentives as we can in the code. And as we look at different things such as um, uh, stormwater basins, as we start to look at uh, incentives, maybe it could be for green roofs. It could be uh, incentives for um, maybe solar panels. I know that some people in the chat have asked about that. Yes, we'll try to incorporate as much incentives for that as we can. Keep in mind, we're limited by uh, international building code, what we can require, but we can definitely look to incentivize. But then I would say, if uh, if you have any additional input on the sustainability plan, sure. Thank ahead. you, Thomas. I would say that a lot of the a lot of the elements within the sustainability plan would be more in keeping with the international building code, um, and would go with our with the, with the building code, which is handled out of the building and codes department team and through the state of South Carolina. But I would add that one example where this has recently been done is, as you all know, we re we were reviewed through um, the Soul Smart program for our solar um, and how we could incentivize or improve our zoning um, related to the installation of solar panels. Um, and we presented that information to the planning commission and then passed it along to you all for review and incorporation into our code. So um, to the attendee this evening, just wanted to let you know that that's an example of how we're making sure that those two things do go together. Thank you, Thomas. Um, unless Michael's got anything else to add, we'll move on to the next question, which is, can you touch on any other incentives for affordable housing on the table in addition to density and height allowances? That's a that's a that's a hard one. It's uh, you know the reason that density and height end up uh, kind of moving to the uh, the front of the pack for incentives is because it's really what developers need to start to get to economies of scale to make it actually work. And so there aren't many additional incentives. I would say, with that being said, I would say that if we're looking at um, housing, mixed use development, residential above commercial, for example, in one of the neighborhood centers or the nodes, there could be the opportunity for a partnership with the city uh, to offer um, an incentive uh, to build affordable housing if the city, for example, has public parking or a parking garage 
associated near or with that development. So I would say those kind of collaborative opportunities can get you additional affordable housing, but in terms of incentives without giving on your setbacks on a particular lot, which most people I don't think uh, would want to do because it would start to impact the adjacent properties. Density and height are your best tool. So it's really a matter of sharpening them and making sure that we give you the, the, the right calculations to fully incentivize a developer to cross that line and do affordable housing. So they're, they're, they're a good tool. They have to be sharp. They have to pay attention to land economics, but I think they're probably the best. I don't know if Christy or Larry have additional um, input on that, but uh, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you guys expand if you do. I would, I would just add, I would just add very quickly that, that, that uh, zoning really does not allow many tools to address this issue. It allows a few, as Thomas mentioned, but the city has other tools and there are other tools in the uh, in the environment that can help. Um, and I would remind I would remind folks that uh, that um, that nonprofit developers who are looking to whose whose goal it is to develop affordable housing will also be able to use some of these incentives to get higher density for uh, for for some give and get. So if we use all of the tools that we have, housing, the uh, housing trust fund, the uh, zoning tools that we have, other kinds of uh, of, uh, of tools that may be in the uh, in the community's uh, uh, toolbox, we can in time get to a much better place as far as affordable housing is concerned. But it will take a number of those tools, and no one tool is going to do it. We've seen that over time that it doesn't work that way. You have to combine a number of different tools, as many tools as you have. And Greenville is beginning to develop a good toolbox of tools to address that. Yeah, Larry took my point exactly. And I think it's worth just reiterating that, you know, we talk about zoning as an essential first step. You know, these incentives are a really good tool, but it essentially enables affordability to happen, but to really um, deploy it at scale and to expect an impact, you have to have those additional tools that are the subsidy, um, that are the nonprofit developers, that are the land trust. So it, it's those additional tools that are outside of zoning that have to do with funding and programming um, that really make the development of, afford of affordable housing feasible. You know, the zoning has to be in place to build the building. Um, and once that's in place, these these programs and the funding have to come along and really get these projects over the finish line. Yep. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat, and if we, I'm going to answer these real quick. If we could go through, and I'm trying to keep if if we could keep the questions in the Q and A box so that I can keep up with them. <laughs> um, are there plans to include traffic calming on existing streets? And um, just to answer that question. Um, we, well, I mean, some of that is in part of the code. That's really not the, the focus of the zoning code. We do have a traffic calming process here in the city, and we have an entire page on that and how we go about that. We have many neighborhoods right now participating in our traffic calming process. And if someone from the team will, we'll try to make sure to put that link into the chat so that, or in the Q and A box, so that everyone has access to learn about our traffic calming here um, within the city of Greenville. The other question that was in the chat is, will you alter existing zoning to allow for development of non single family units? And we do have many zoning classifications currently that allow for um, non single family units. Um, we have several multifamily zoning district classifications as well as our commercial and service classifications, but we are also looking at how we can incorporate ADUs into our existing single family zoning classifications. Um, Christy Thomas, do y'all want to elaborate on that anymore? Christy, I'll let you run with that one. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, in the areas that are um, currently zoned single family, you know, tools like ADUs is um, something that we're looking at. And we think that'll be a really useful tool to, you know, add back or reallow or really ADUs have been a historic housing type. And so sort of reallowing those in the single family areas um, an, another suite of tools that we are developing for communities that want it and this is in conjunction with that um, sort of missing middle survey that happened in conjunction with the comprehensive plan um, it are creating some tools for those 
sort of middle scale typologies. So, you know, right now Greenville has tools for single family. You have tools for sort of multifamily. When you think about that, it's sort of apartment buildings and bigger. Um, and there's, there's a bit of a gap in some of those sort of house scale districts is, is what we like to call them. So they may look like a house, feel like a house, but it, it could be two, three, four units. Um, so we are developing tools and um, that would help allow some of those types of developments to happen. Um, but you know that wouldn't certainly would not be allowed everywhere that's existing single family. Those are only in places that would want those type of tools in their community. So we're um, we would be working with communities to think about uh, neighborhoods of of where that may be appropriate. And maybe it's in those sort of transition areas from single family up to the nodes and corridors. So um, thinking about deploying those in, in specific areas where they make sense. Thank you, Christy. And then the next question, and um, I think this is a great one because we want to make sure people know where to get the information and we're not quite there yet, but in a couple of months, several months, we will be. Um, there is a question. Will the co preview be available on the website? Thomas, would you like to take that one? Yes. The answer is yes, it will be on the website. And so yes. I would also note that as we as as we kind of roll out the code preview, maybe what we'll do is try to get a preview of that on maybe the July webinar, maybe. I mean, we'll start to look at the yes. timing to work with you on that, Shannon, but maybe we'll get that on a webinar and then get that on the website. But the answer is everybody will have access to that uh, at the uh, on the Greenville uh, GBL 2040 development code website. Yes. Um, once we have that ready, um, and as we're ready to start putting pieces of that out, we will try to incorporate that into a future code connection session. Um, we're not quite there yet. We've got a, a couple more months of work easily to do before we get there. But yes, we'll incorporate it into a code connection session and it will be available for the public to preview. Um, thank you for that question. I think we're trying our best to, and I'll just go ahead and put a plug in to say this. Um, MJ from our communications team is on tonight and we are doing our best to consistently get the word out about this project um, and go out and visit as many people as we can about this project. And if there's anything that any of our participants this evening would like to suggest on how we can continue to do that, or if there's other ideas or suggestions, please make sure you email us so we can incorporate that into our public outreach campaign. Okay, moving on to our next question. So thank you for that. Is could incentive based zoning be used to encourage developers to build in energy efficiencies in new buildings? Again, I think this is probably to a building code question, but I'll defer to Christy to take that one. Yeah, I um, think that's right on Shannon. There are, you know, a lot of this is tied to the building code. It happens sort of within the walls of the building. Um, we are and, and generally do think about some best practices that we incorporate, particularly into the standards that um, developments have to adhere to. An example of that is, um, you know, parking incentives. So if you provide the infrastructure for um, charging of electric vehicles, then maybe you can provide less parking on site because you are sort of future proofing and adding that sustainability component. Um, another example may be um, if you choose to do um, low impact development stormwater controls, which maybe take a little bit more space on site, um, then maybe that's also a trade off of parking. You have to provide less parking because you are doing this more sustainable approach to stormwater. Um, so we do build in best practices like that um, for particularly site elements um, whenever we can that address sustainability. Thank you, Christy. So our next question is about the subdivision regulations and will the subdivision regulations be integrated into the new code? The um, comment is these are important with respect to block sizes that support a grid pattern to enhance walkability in new developments, correct? So uh, Christy, is that another one for you? Yeah, and I can tag team that with um, Thomas and Larry as well if they wanna add anything. Yes, um, subdivision standards are something that we are incorporating into the code uh, and they will include things like block standards and and subdivisions are also a really great opportunity to impact things like streets. So we want to make sure that, you know, a lot of times when redevelopment is happening on a single parcel, that's quite small. We don't have the opportunity to put in new streets, but when subdivision happens, we do. And we want to make sure that those streets are um, the types of streets that add to walkability. We want to make sure that 
the blocks are um, requiring a certain size that they are smaller. So it helps add to that, that walkable component and that those streetscapes are up to those standards. So yes, we are looking at subdivision and that is a really great opportunity to um, make excellent impacts to that, that walkability component. And yeah, the, the only thing I would add, the only oh, thing I would ahead. add to that is that we are part of that, that. That's a great question because part of what we're looking at with regard to subdivision regulations is also EDSM engineering design specifications manual, which also addresses street widths and kind of comes back to that quality of space, quality of streetscape space, the pedestrian space. And so all of that is connected and to the point of, you know, kind of gridded streets or connected streets. Absolutely. It's also something that we're looking at very closely in the 5 area development plans. How do we ensure they have connectivity? They don't have, uh, you know, kind of uh, a plethora of suburban cul-de-sacs. How do we ensure that those are connected uh, in the future? And so all of that does relate back to the code in that particular area. It kind of relates to the uh, node plans, but absolutely we will be looking into that. And that is part of the code. Thank you, Thomas. And then another question is, will the code require? So I think what they're trying to ask is, will the code require versus just incentivize functional open space in dense compact developments to ensure quality of life goals are accomplished? So I would say that as part of the subdivision regulations, there will be minimum standards for open space for subdivisions. And so once a subdivision crosses over a threshold, we haven't determined that yet, but say it were maybe 10 or 15 or 20 units or lots, then there would be a minimum standard for open space. And so we're looking at that. We haven't finalized it yet, but the answer is that yet. Yeah, yes, as we cross the threshold, there will be minimum requirements. We also have requirement we will we will be having requirements for the um, particularly mixed use areas that are those denser areas. Um, so we often call that we have a minimum pedestrian amenity space and what that means is on that ground floor um, whether it's sort of a plaza or um, it's just space that's accessible to pedestrians like a courtyard um, there are those minimum requirements built in and there are quality requirements associated with that so it's not just a patch of green that is on the edge of a development that is unusable. You know, we want to make sure that that is contributing to the public space, particularly in the denser areas. You know, downtown is a really great example of how these um, pedestrian amenities have been built in into your development patterns. And so we want to ensure that um, that also happens as these nodes and corridors densify. And so there will be requirements that speak to um, those pedestrian amenity spaces and sort of think about plazas and, and things like that that um, for, that add to the quality of that open space. It's not just open. There's also quality associated with it. Thank you, Christy. And that's a very good point. It is is the quality of the open space is really important um, as we look at specifically um, these more dense and compact urbanized areas. Um, and I think that that's something that we don't want to lose focus on. Um, is that just having the path, there's, there's a benefit to the passive open space, but then there's also a benefit to a more active and functional open space as well. And the quality of that is super important and we, for the long-term health of the community. At least I think that's what the planners think. I hope most people agree with that. <laughs> Um, and then there, there, I see your question, Phil, um, about living in Hollingsworth Park and what would the new neighborhoods be considered a residential district. We are not far enough along yet. We haven't, we haven't finalized any, I mean, we're not to that point yet. We're still trying to um, test a lot of our um, assumptions and test where we are with the code, identifying what's important to the community through our public input processes. So we, we, haven't, we haven't gotten far enough along yet. Um, to, and that's not good grammar, but y'all know what I'm trying to say. Um, we haven't, we're not far enough along yet to be able to answer that question, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue to look at all of the zoning classifications moving forward. Um, and I think, um, just before we run out of time, Kate, the same answer to your question about the single family infill, we're not, I mean, the, the new code won't be, won't be, um, in the same type of format that we have right now, and we're going to be, it'll be looking at things differently. And so 
Um, it may not be what we have currently in the code. We're looking at how to really to really make this um, code completely different. And so more to come on your questions to you. If y'all need additional information or want to talk more about that, please email me and I'll be glad to have a conversation and dive into that more with you. But we're unfortunately running up on the end of our time tonight and I don't have we don't have enough time to get into all of that, but we're not far enough along yet to get to either of those. I mean, to be able to really give a good answer to either of those questions. And with that, we are at the end of our question and answers and at the end of our time for this evening. So before we sign off for our May co connection, do any of our members of our CZB team have anything else they'd like to add before we leave this evening? Larry, how about you? <laughs> well, um, it's just been a great session. I think we've I think you've got some good questions. We've tried to clarify um, and to be more specific about some of the things we've been working on. We've listened very carefully. Um, all of our team members have have listened very carefully to uh, to the community, and we've tried to reflect that in the in the in the writings, in the suggestions, and the in the um, in the topics that we've uh, have looked to cover in this in this in this webinar, and we'll continue to look at as we develop the uh, code. So, so I want to thank I want to thank citizens. For being as open and as uh, and as direct and as helpful as they've been in the past, but I really do appreciate these opportunities to have a dialogue with the residents about their zoning code. Thank you, Larry. Thomas, Christy, anything else from you guys before we sign off? I would just say uh, thanks to everybody who has participated both tonight and previous webinars, but also for coming out uh, last month in some. Uh, Pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty good brainstorms uh, when we had some of the public open houses. And so, yeah, thanks for coming out. The input is invaluable. Please uh, continue to, to 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 stay a part of this process. It's much appreciated. Yes, Christy, anything? I, I just wanted to echo um, what Thomas and Larry said, and thank everybody for being engaged. You know, part of what we're trying to do here is make that link between the high level planning goals and as we really are going to start diving in deep to some of these zoning and issues. And that's, that's the area that we live in. And, you know, we love all the nitty gritty details. So as we do that, you know, I just encourage everybody to continue to ask questions um, because we want to help bring everybody along in this process and make sure that everybody is able to be involved and um, able to express their um, views and their vision for what they want their neighborhoods to be. So um, stick with us as we dive into the details, because it's where it gets really fun. Thank you, and I agree with you, Christy, and that's a good segue into, I notice a lot of our same, um, it, you know, we have some of our same people that have joined us for many of our co-connection sessions over these last few months, and I just want to say thank you to each of you all for coming back every month, being here to support through this project, to provide information to us through this project, but we would also encourage you to please get your neighbors and your community members involved as much as we can. We want to do everything we can to make sure that we touch as many people as we can throughout this process. So thank you all for being here and thank you for continuing to come back and encourage as many people as you can within our community to also attend these sessions. And the final thing I'd like to leave you with is just as a reminder, this isn't your only access to the staff or to CZB during this process. We do these once a month to be able to try to provide an educational session to our community. But please know that you have access to us, you know, in between those, this is not your only point of access. If there's questions you have about the process or information you would like to know about any of these specific issues that were raised tonight, um, please feel free to always reach out to the planning staff and we will make sure to try to answer your question. And if we can't, we'll send it to CZB and ask them to address the question. Um, and so, and they've been fabulous to do that for us um, thus far. We've had some people that have wanted specific time with CZB and they have been excellent to provide that one-on-one -on -one time with individuals within our community and to provide answers to your questions. So having said that, I would encourage you to reach out to us anytime um, and with that, we wish everyone a great next few weeks, safety over the upcoming beginning of summer, and we will see you the second Wednesday of June, June 8th, 5 p.m. With that, we'll say good night and thank you all. Thank you.